With me in the studio is Reverend Rogers at Wembeire. That name is a little bit complex, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, nailed it. Hey, uh, until I get it right, I'm not giving up. Uh, would you like to say hello to our people, and then we can uh, dash into our discussion? Good evening to you, our dear viewers, brethren in Christ. As a matter of fact, it's an opportunity and a joy to get to share with you. I come to you from the Africa Center for Apologetics Research, a ministry that equips believers across Africa for the defense of the faith, for biblical discernment, and for cult evangelism. We'll be sharing more about that as we go along in our talk. So I look forward to having a nice time with you. I think that is very, very, very profound. Uh, you're once again welcome. Last, last week we were doing an introduction to cults, what is a cult, their characteristics and the different patterns. Uh, could we give a small brief uh, review of that in about two minutes and then we can dash to today's discussion. We began to look at the subject of cults last week and especially recognized that this is a very controversial area and sometimes often very much misunderstood yet one that is addressed by every book in the New Testament, except one book, the book of Philemon. We learned that when we talk about a cult, in most cases we are thinking about it in terms of beliefs and behaviors. We are looking at how a group believes and how they behave as a result of their beliefs. We define the cult, theologically speaking, as a group which, while claiming to be Christian, either directly or indirectly denies one or more of the central teachings of the Christian faith. We noted that there are those teachings which must be true for Christianity to be possible, and if one denies them, they ultimately cannot be saved. Like the Trinity, like the unity of God, like the deity of Jesus, his humanity and his divinity, like salvation by grace, that these are fundamental and core teachings that define uh, biblical Christianity. And anyone who denies or distorts them, whether it is one or more of these teachings, ultimately they forfeit their salvation. And we noted that today our world is uh, full of religious groups that look Christian, claim to be Christian, in many ways even resemble Christianity, but indirectly or directly deny or distort these fundamentals, which is why as a church in Uganda we need to be concerned and we need to find ways in which we can address this danger of deception, but even more importantly, to disciple our believers to stand firm for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That is beautiful. I, I, I am hopeful that that helps us to pick it up from there today after getting such uh, an introduction and a review from last week. Now, today we'll be looking at how uh, we found ourselves, how people have found themselves in these cultic groups. And then we'll also be looking at why they are there even when they know that there is danger there. What keeps these guys there. What keeps them held in that kind of place even when they know that there is hot fire here and we are headed, headed for doom in this thing. So we'll be looking at that today and probably uh, uh, in the second segment we'll be looking at what the church can do, the church's response. What can we do? We can't just raise our hands, surrender and keep saying these guys there's nothing we can do. There is something that we can definitely do. So Reverend Rogers, how have certain people found themselves there? Mm. Should mm. we want to say they go there when they know or they just some of them find themselves in this thing when they don't know that mm. they're in the wrong mm. thing altogether? Mm. This is a very interesting question, Emma. You know, uh, someone has said that cults are like HIV AIDS. Either you are infected or you are affected. If you are in and a victim, you are certainly infected and you need help. But you may not necessarily be in a chaotic group, but you have a loved one or a friend or a workmate who is involved and therefore you need to be concerned. So step number one, we need to understand that the challenge of cults is one that should be concerning to every believer and every Christian has a responsibility to do something about this. Number two, is that today if you sample 10 people randomly that call themselves Christian in Uganda, 
there is a chance that seven out of the ten, while claiming to be Christian, subscribe to certain beliefs or set of doctrines that are not actually biblical. So what we are talking about is a pollution that has pervaded the church, that cults are everywhere, within and without, no matter where you look. Now what is very interesting, I used to think that people who join cults and false religious groups were the illiterate, those who have not studied, those who are not exposed. I thought people go into cults because of ignorance. But then as I began my research into cults and false religious groups, I began to realize that actually that's not true. Most of the people who join cultic groups are actually some of the smartest people you will ever know or ever meet. For a cult leader to formulate a set of doctrines and have followers to the thousands who consistently maintain their fervent commitment to this man, that man cannot be a fool. That man cannot be an uncivilized guy. He's brilliant, he's smart, he knows what he is doing. Which is why it is very important for us to always remember that the first step to addressing cults is to avoid the biases that we come with as we address this challenge. Once we begin to think that people are in a cult because they are ignorant or they are not smart or they are not educated, we have already missed it and therefore we will keep wondering why are they there? Why do people join in the first place? And why do people who, while already seeing danger signals that the group they are in is dangerous, continue to be there nonetheless? I have met a number of people whom we talk about their faith, and they recognize that actually the church they are going to has cultic tendencies. But to my surprise, they, they are not eager to leave. They still go. And the question we want to answer tonight is, why? Why? Now, there are a number of, uh, there is uh, some research that has been done into the why of cult recruitment and retainment. And I want to share some few things with you. One of the researchers on cults, a man named Michael Langone, has said that there are two interacting forces in cult recruitment. Number one is that they are the tactics that the cult usually uses to recruit, to convert, and to hold the members captive. But number two, there is what we call the personal vulnerability of the potential recruit. That the blame for joining a cult is not always on the people who recruit them. It is also on the people who get recruited. Let me explain what I mean by this, especially beginning with the personal vulnerability of the potential recruit. Re 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 recruit yeah. That there are about four reasons why a person might become a potential recruit. These reasons could be intellectual, they could be emotional, they could be social, and most of all, they could be spiritual. I know there are people who have joined cultic groups because of an intellectual longing for answers. Maybe they questioned Christianity in areas that were confusing for them. They didn't get the right answers from their church leadership. And in their pursuit to satisfy their intellectual hunger, they ended up in a group that sounded academic, philosophical, looked like they knew what they are doing, and before they knew it, they were in the trap of the group. But there are also those who join for emotional reasons, a need to be loved, a need to be respected, it could be that they were going through some hard time and the only group that was there to help them in this crisis was the Celtic Church. I have seen like for instance these days when we were in lockdown and people were really struggling for lack of food. Now imagine a church across the street comes to a woman who is a single mother with five kids. She has no idea where she will get the next meal. And all of a sudden this church says, we are here for you. We will give you food, we will take care of your children, and they bomb her with a lot of love that she's never known before. By the end of lockdown, this woman will not have any motivation to go back to a traditional church that never cared for her when she was in crisis. So this church has made her emotional longing and satisfied it. It is logical that this woman with her children are going to follow this new church and begin to fellowship there no matter what it teaches in terms of doctrine. But number three, sometimes the reason is social. That you have people who have a need for a role or an identity in a group. 
Maybe they've been at their church for a long time and for some reason they've not been recognized by their pastor. They believe they have giftings but no one seems to be utilizing them. And we are seeing a mass move of the young people out of the traditional churches especially. Because young people believe that they have the gifts but the traditional church has not provided room for them to exercise their gifts. So what will they do when a new church begins or a fellowship in town that seems to be saying you can do it, you actually God can use you? They are going to go where they can display their talents and their skills and their giftings. But number four is that there is the spiritual reason that there are people who have a longing for God. They want to be closer to God. They have a desire for the supernatural, for the mystic. Today we are hearing the young generation talking about the, the mysteries of the kingdom, the secrets of heaven, the deep things that religious people cannot understand. So you can imagine, if you meet young people like those who are spiritually hungry, they are longing to be in touch with the supernatural. And there is a prophet in town who says, every weekend I have breakfast with Jesus. Why wouldn't they follow such a man so that hopefully one of these days they can join him and Jesus on the buffet table? It makes a lot of sense. There are many people involved in cults and false religious groups today. Not because they hate God, but actually they went there looking for God. An experience, a closer relationship that they were not experiencing in their traditional churches. What they didn't know is that while this new group had everything spiritual and vibrant and, and ex, you know, explosive, they were actually Christianizing the emotional feel, but it had nothing to do with biblical Christianity. And before they know it, pa, they are captives. So, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual. And, that, and we are saying that these are some of the reasons why different individuals may be drawn into cults. But remember there is the other side, the cult itself that is recruiting. How does it manage to recruit and hold people captive? Now again, this cult researcher named Michael Angon has done a very good job in identifying these factors. He has come up with something that I call a 3D syndrome. He says that there are three Ds that are largely are factors as to why people are caught up and retained in cults. D number one is one of deception. That some of these cultic groups, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they will deceive their members by giving them false promises. They may promise you a visa, they may promise you healing, they may promise you that you'll get a job that you've desperately longed for but you do not deserve. They may tell you lots of things about heaven and what will happen to you when you join their group. But usually they also hide their true identity. That when they come to you, they will not tell you some of the things in their closet that they don't want you to know. They will paint this wonderful picture and you begin to feel like heaven has come down on earth. And then slowly along the way, you begin to see some skeletons in the closet that they never told you about. But by this time it is too late for you to go back. You've already committed too much to walk away. Sometimes they will suppress information. Like most of the cultic groups, for instance, will not allow their members to study or read literature outside their group. They will tell you the only inspired information is what our leaders have designed. If you find it elsewhere, do not read it. So if you don't have much information about the group, and all they have told you is wonderful and heavenly, and they have promised you things that your itching ears wanted to hear, do you see how easy it is for you to fall to the play of deception? But then number two, there is the D of dependence. That when you come into a cultic group, you come as an individual, as I, as myself, as me. But soon you join a family of believers where the language is we and us, group ideology. They slowly break down your individuality until you can no longer make choices or decisions for yourself and what is right is what the group has decided. They alienate you from close family members and friends. Before you know it, the only family you have is the one inside the group. So even if you chose to leave, you leave and go where? 
If for 10 years all you have known as friends and family are the ones in the group, if you walk away from the group, where are you going to start from? They've broken you down in terms of your individuality and now you cannot exist by yourself apart from the group whose ideology is shaped by the leadership that strategically knows that they have you in their sway and you can never make any independent choices anymore. But number three, if all that fails, they will use what we call dread or fear that sometimes some of these groups will be teaching you that if you ever leave their group, you are eternally lost. Salvation is only found in their group. Most of them will teach you that every other church is wrong. And the only way to retain your salvation or promise of eternal life is if you stay inside the group. And if you leave, either they will mud sling you or they will shun you and make sure you never have any fellowship with the people who are inside and they alienate you to a place where you even probably want to commit suicide. So out of fear of the consequences, many people stay in a cult, not because they don't know that something is wrong, but they are afraid, what will happen if I quit? If I am a mother, and I have my son who is being sponsored in a university abroad by a, a cultic church, I'm going to be thinking, if I leave this church that I know now is cultic, what's going to happen to my son who's abroad? Will they continue paying his tuition? Might they do something or poison him or even kill him? So out of fear of what might happen to her son, this woman is likely to stay in the group because she wants to protect the and safeguard the well-being of her son. Mm -hmm. I meet many people who say, I know something is wrong with our church. But you see, I cannot leave. I'm entrapped. Reason this, reason that, reason that. Now if I go, where will I go? Would the reason slightly be that the, the, the churches that are teaching solid truth are broke, that they cannot give this kind of help to certain people that need it? Not really. One uh, great famous cult researcher called Walter Martin wrote a book called The Kingdom of the Cults. And in this book he said that cults are the unpaid bills of the church. Wherever the church has failed to play its role to fully and holistically shepherd God's people, cultists like parasites have opportunistically come into those weak places, taking advantage of them, drawing members away. Dissatisfaction with what the traditional church is offering is one of the major reasons, for instance, many young people are walking away from the church and going into unaccountable fellowships. That whenever the church fails to do its role and people feel a hunger for something that they need but is not in their church, they are bound to go and look for it elsewhere. As green pastures or dry pastures? <laughs> well, unfortunately, <laughs> There is always a saying that, that, the, that, the, that the grass on the other side is always greener than what is here. Until you get there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what you have is a very good attractive advertisement and promotion mm -hmm. from these false religious groups that look like they are the answer to the questions that you have been asking for a long time. What the traditional church has not been giving you, they are saying if you come, you will never it be the same again. Available. But usually when you come in, the first few days are great. They treat you like you are Miss Uganda, you know, you, you know like this uh, taxi ideology. When you are going to board a taxi and the taxi stops where you are, conductor will worship you. He will call you all sorts of names and titles. Mzehi, Haji, a Professor, a Musumba. Because all he cares about is to he get in the taxi. To get you inside. But the moment you get in the taxi, you realize the conductor's eyes stay in the window outside. <laughs> you no longer matter. Now he's looking for the next two, for the, the next, next passenger. passenger. Should you reach your stage and you find that you are missing 500 shillings on what you were supposed to pay? That's when you will know who this conductor is. He will call you names, he might even call you the devil himself. So you wonder what happened to the professor who entered the taxi? <laughs> so that is the kind of strategy that false groups also use. On the outside, they put up a front of great care, great concern. They will love you even more than your own mother loved you. But as you come in, as days go by, 
you begin to realize there is a set of rules to obey. Mm -hmm. There is a certain uniform to put on. Mm -hmm. There is a certain way you are supposed to do things. Mm -hmm. If you do them well, there is a reward to entice you to keep going. If you make even one mistake, the punishment is so severe, they make sure they threaten you or blackmail you in a way that you can't believe these are the people that we are throwing, we are throwing hugs all around you. And I think this is a warning to our young people who are leaving traditional churches today. Your church may not be meeting all your needs, but at least you know it. At least it has been accountable for all this long. Are you sure that this new group or this new fellowship you are going to, which seems to be promising instant heaven, are you sure that it is exactly what you are being promised? And what happens when you get there and the promises you thought you would get are actually not there? Not there. Many young people are realizing that too late. By the time they realize they are in the wrong group, some of our young women are already pregnant, Oh, they are already have dropped out of campus. They sold their tuition as a seed or whatever to the man of God. And usually the people who have been victims of cults are not only broken and disappointed with themselves for allowing themselves to be deceived, but usually they conclude that it is God who failed them and they turn their backs on Christianity. That is how dangerous it can be, uh, how you turn your back on Christianity because you fell apart with a certain group of people that did not fulfill your need. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be an illiterate to be hooked up in a, cult, in a cult. Guys who are hooked up are smart, intelligent, they have degrees, they have bachelor, they, they have uh, diplomas, they are smart guys, lawyers, doctors. Uh, uh, name them, name them. They are really guys you don't expect to be, to be, to be, to be in those kind of groups. And then the art is recruit, convert, and retain. So you don't want to be recruited <laughs> after converted, uh, after converting you, and then definitely being retained to those kind of things. So Reverend Rogers, in in, in a bit, why are guys still hooked up in this thing, even when they know there is a problem there? in a bit and then we can <clears throat> swing into the other part of, of, of the show. So many reasons why many people can be hooked up in cults. As we have noted, some people are hooked in there because they are ignorant of the group's teaching in terms of like their theology or doctrines. Others are hooked up for social or emotional or intellectual or even spiritual reasons. Others are hooked up because there are consequences if they should leave the group. Maybe some are in the employee of this church and they know if I leave the church fellowship, it means that I will not be, uh, I will not be employed anymore. Maybe some of these groups have used the economic or financial incentives to hold their members. And therefore, these members know if I walk away, it means I am walking away from financial privileges. Some of these other people are held in these cultic groups by fear or dread because they know that once they walk out away from this group, they will be walking away from their eternal salvation. At least that's what they have been told. You should also always know that the cost of leaving some of these cultic groups is very high. They are cultic groups which if you are a couple and one of the partners wants to leave the group, the group will recommend a divorce. And in most cases, they will take away your children because you are considered as unstable and a deserter. They will encourage your partner who has remained faithful to the group to marry someone within that very group and move on. Now, there are not many people who would like to lose their families in the name of religion. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of people, couples, that are caught up in the world of cults out of fear that if they should leave, they will be leaving behind their spouses and their children. And for this and so many other reasons, many people are aware that they are in churches that either are cultic or exhibit cultic tendencies, but they feel trapped, they have no way to get out. And as a matter of fact, they need your help. They need your prayers. They need you to reach out to them and talk to them. But even more importantly, they need the traditional church to create a conducive atmosphere that can nurture and shepherd them. Remember, 
that out of a lie does not necessarily mean into the truth. When these people eventually come out, who's receiving them? Who's helping to rehabilitate them back into the truth and back into true church? So these and many other reasons need to be considered when we think about people entrapped in cults. And above all else, we keep asking ourselves, what can the church do? What can the church do? Not only to stop people from being recruited into cults, but to help those who are already victims of cultic groups, not only to be restored back to the faith, but hopefully to be put on a path of healing and reconciliation with God. All right. Now, with, with that kind of bit, uh, those who are sending uh, all those uh, uh, questions on WhatsApp and, and, and uh, YouTube, it is, it is well. Uh, we, we are getting, we are getting all, all that information. Now, we want to get to the bit, what can the church do? We cannot <coughs> raise our hands and look at things, go a mess, and look at things falling apart, and there is literally nothing we can do. There is something we can do. And that is what we want to bring to us today. And, and, and Reverend Rogers in the next bit will be, will be discussing those other, uh, other things. What can you do as a person, as a pastor, as a church? What can you do? Mm. So Reverend Rogers, let's dive into this bit. Mm. What mm. would be the rightful response of mm. pastors, mm. of mm. churches, of traditional churches mm. to this mm. kind of, of, uh, of trouble mm. that has mm. befallen the church? Mm. In answering this question, it is very important to remember that the Bible, and especially the New Testament, not only warns believers of the danger and the deception of cults, but reminds them of their responsibility to guard their faith, for pastors to guard their flock from the savage wolves, but even for individual believers to be discerning and be able to defend their faith. In fact, wherever you find a Bible passage that is warning about false teachings, it is always calling believers to watch out, see to it, take care, be careful, make sure those imperatives are a call to action and responsibility. In other words, it is the responsibility not just of the corporate church, but for all individual believers to recognize that the struggle for our faith, the battle between truth and error, is one that must be engaged in by all, irrespective of status or opposition. This is not the domain reserved for pastors and ordained ministers, but for all caring believers. Now, I find that usually in facing this challenge, that many people exhibit different attitudes. They are believers who, for instance, will exhibit ignorance. I don't know what the group teaches. I don't think I'm the right person to engage it and help those who are in, so I will let the pastors do that. There are those who will respond with indifference. Me, I go to a good church. My old family members are okay and no one is a victim of a cult. So why do I care what other churches are doing, whether cultic or not? And I think most of the Christians in Uganda today face this challenge with great indifference as with the attitude of me, I'm safe, my family, we are okay, so I don't care who believes what. Then we also must remember that we are living in an age of relativism, where truth is no longer considered absolute. I meet so many people, even mature believers, men and women I respect in the faith. And when we talk about this area of cults, they ask me, why do you care what other people believe? Why don't you just mind your business? It is up to them to decide what to believe, and if they choose to go to hell, why is that your concern? And friends, if you are one of those people who think that way, I would like to challenge you to reconsider. Because the people who are going to hell every day, in the name of deception and false teaching, are our brothers and sisters, and have human value just like you and me. So what would be the right approach, or at least the right attitude? I want to propose three things that the church can do that can especially help the church, not only in identifying the cultic groups in question, but in seeking to understand them, in seeking to answer their claims and their objections, but even more importantly, in evangelizing victims that are caught up in these groups. Number one is that the church must be intentional on discipleship. When we talk about discipleship, we are talking about God's people being grounded in God's truth, 
God's people growing in God's grace. God's people having the ability to understand what they believe and the reason behind the what of their faith. When the church fails in its effort at creating disciples, you have a church full of sacramentized believers, converts as a matter of fact, who cannot tell their left from their right, and therefore will not even be able to identify the savage wolves of false teachings when they come in. You will agree with me that the church's major challenge today is a lack of serious strategic discipleship. We care more about numbers and about events, but very few churches are actually going through a process of discipleship with their members. The church that disciples its members is the church that reaches the unity and the maturity of the faith that we read about in Ephesians chapter 4. But number two, we must remember that discipleship doesn't go alone. People who know the truth will always also be able to identify what is not true. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 4, the Apostle Paul tells the Colossian believers he has been describing the mystery of the Godhead who is Christ. And then in verse 4 he says that I tell you these things so that no one will delude you with finely sounding arguments. Paul says the reason I am grounding you in truth is so that you will recognize the craftily designed arguments of the false teachers that look Christian and true on the outside, but actually are not. When God's people know what is true, they will easily discern what is not true or what is almost right but actually not right. Discernment goes with discipleship. And number three, you must remember that when God's people are discerning, then they are able to defend their faith, they are able to explain their faith, they are able to clarify it when it is under attack or being confused by some of today's contemporary false missionaries that are on the mission field. That believers who can explain the what and the why of their faith are the ones that are in a position not only to safeguard themselves against false teachings, but to identify them and answer them and evangelize those that are caught up in them. When the church fails on discipleship, it produces a community of undiscerning believers and therefore who are vulnerable to the threat of cults and their deception. On the other hand, a church that is discipling its believers will produce discerning believers who are able to defend their faith in the face of error and falsehood. But how do you do this discipleship? Number one is that as a church you must be intentional on being a Bible-centered church. God's word is the only inspired word we have. And it's not only inspired, but it is the only truth that sets captives free. When you fill the pulpit with stories and jokes and empty promises of what people's itching ears want to hear, and you do not make the word of God central, which is the only one powerful to change people's lives, you will continue informing people, but you will unlikely transform them or even reform them. You must be a church that is intentional on knowing the word of God and making it known in the world of God. But number two, you don't want to just teach people how to read, interpret, and apply Bible verses. You also want to teach them the doctrines of the Christian faith. What are those essential, those fundamental teachings that define Christianity, that differentiate it from any other world religion? What makes them important? And what are the implications of believing these doctrines in the day-to-day -day lives of believers? When believers do not know the fundamental doctrines of their faith, how can they even know if a false religious group is tampering with them or in a subtle way distorting them to arrive at a different conclusion? If I have never been told or taught from the scriptures that Jesus as the Son of God was actually God, when someone from a group that believes that Jesus is Michael the archangel comes to me, how am I supposed to respond? Agree with him or disagree? Because personally, I don't even know what I believe. So teaching Christians the fundamentals of our faith is extremely important. And that is why the early church 
in the first two, three centuries of the church, came up with summarized creeds that were particularly formulated not only to answer the era of false teachers in their time, but to summarize biblical doctrines on which Christianity stands. Every time you recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or several other creeds that we get from the early period of the church, you are basically summarizing the fundamental beliefs and convictions of biblical Christianity. Do our children know the Apostles' Creed? Do they know why we recite it? Or do we recite it so that we can be confirmed and we can enjoy Holy Communion? The things that looked at as very traditional. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. are looked at as a waste of time. Kind of religious. They Religi say, ah, you're religious if you people, pray those creeds. People prefer to dive into tongues and, and prophecies and receive this, receive these prophecies from the man of God. Why do you waste time reciting this thing? And what we are really saying is that these things are not just religious recitations that we make. They are actually summarizing the doctrines of the Christian faith as taught in scripture. And these are things that define and undergird biblical Christianity. Knowing who God is, who Jesus is, how salvation is received, what the resurrection of Jesus means and its implications for all of life. When a church is not strong, on teaching their members biblical doctrine, the truth on which Christianity stands, these believers will be blown back and forth by waves of false doctrine and false teachers who twist the teaching of the Bible to their own gain. I have a friend who calls those kind of people Nile garbage. Where the wind blows, that is where they go. That's right. I, I have a testimony from a friend who is a pastor in one of the Pentecostal churches. Um, uh, and, and you know some Pentecostal churches don't really take time to study the creeds and these kind of things. So I think he was attending a particular study and they were going through the creeds in particular. When he understood the sense in the creeds, he went and started teaching his own children. <laughs> His own children, the creeds, and he's, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a, a pastor in one of the Pentecostal churches mm. around Kampala. Mm. He mm. taught his children mm. personally the creeds and their sense in those creeds. And he started well because the battle for truth really begins at home. The first church is the family. When the family is broken, it creates a broken church because that's where broken families go. But when the children in the home are taught the essentials of their faith, then you can be sure that these same children will become part of a community of believers at church that know what they believe, why they believe what they believe, and know how to communicate these wonderful truths winsomely. The problem with our church today is that we have an emotional hype type of Christianity. They feel good. We danced, we sang, we, 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 we ate some good food. Oh, church must be wonderful. But what do you really believe? Well, it's complicated. You just have to take it by faith. You know, you can't understand these things. And then tomorrow a cultist comes and says, by the way, I can tell you the secrets of heaven. And these young people are going to go. Who doesn't want to know the secrets of heaven? But if they knew what the Bible already says about heaven, they wouldn't be running after a false teacher to know the secrets. Why would you want secrets of heaven when they have already been revealed in the Bible you hold? The church must go back to the Bible. Not only rediscover the primacy of teaching the word of God in a consistent, coherent, expository manner, but even more importantly, rediscover those fundamental doctrines that define Christianity and set it apart from any other religion. But there was also another point that I wanted to make that I think is very important. Mm, go ahead. That it is wonderful to know the word of God. It is wonderful to know the doctrines of our Christian faith. But it would also be good if our church knew something about the cults. Now, whenever I say these people are saying, wait a minute. Instead of spending time worshipping God, are you saying now we need to be experts on, on cultism and demonology? Isn't that losing focus? I am not saying that you need to be an expert on cults and their characteristics and their ways in order for you to defend your faith. What I'm saying is that you need to know what kind of groups you are dealing with, especially if you are a pastor. 
Your church members come to you and they say, some missionaries knocked on our door and they were teaching us that Satan was the elder brother of Jesus. As a pastor, you are going to be stuck. How do you advise your church members if you don't even know which group they are talking about? And the pastor who is at the front line, especially in this battle of truth, you must be knowledgeable, not just about the word of God, but also the world in which this word is communicated. And one way is by trying to know about the alternative spiritualities that we have in our country. When somebody says this is a cultic group, you want to know what kind of group is this? Where is it coming from? What are some of its major doctrines and emphasis? What are their methods of recruitment so that you can know how to counteract them? What are their names? What are those ways they are using to appeal to the young people, for instance? When you have an idea of some of those things that characterize these groups, you have enough basis to know how to answer them, how to respond to their queries or objections, but even more importantly, on how to equip your church members to engage in meaningful evangelistic conversations that not only expose the error in the beliefs of the cultic group, but even more importantly, explain what they themselves as believers believe in the hope that they could even convince these people in cults to convert to true biblical Christianity. Most of the pastors today, good theologians, wonderful, lost in the Bible, they don't want to know what is happening in their world. And then tomorrow when their church members start being taken left, right, center, they are confused, they don't know how to respond because they did not do research to understand what kind of spiritual groups or conflicts or alternatives are playing on their church members. And that is why organizations like the Africa Center for Apologetics Research is here to monitor religious groups across the continent, to provide timely, usable information that can be taken advantage of, especially by Christian leaders in the country, so that they may not just know what is true, but they may know the kind of religious environment in which they work and the challenges it poses, and therefore draft a better curriculum that will train their ministers, that will train their missioners on the front line of missions, that will train their young people on how to identify, how to understand, and how to respond to cultic, cultic teachings and false religious groups. That is very beautiful uh, to know. The Bible I often read uh, in Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6, uh, following says, uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, when you follow down, it says there are those who have rejected knowledge. And then there are also those who have refused to teach other people what they're supposed to know. I wonder what part you are in. Either you have rejected the knowledge or you have refused to teach others the rightful things that they are supposed to know. Now that is very, very, a very, a very dangerous thing when you reject or when you reject to teach people the truth. It is a very beautiful thing and uh, for today's uh, ending bit of it, uh, the, the, the taxi conductor analogy would be a very good one for you to go away with. If you have forgotten everything, uh, don't forget the taxi conductor analogy. Reverend Rogers, we need to be out of here. In a minute, you're parting short, and then we should be out of this place. Brothers, the battle for truth has been raging since Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, and it's not about to end. No matter how long we talk about cults and false teachings, in fact, they are a characteristic of the end times, so we cannot wipe them away. But you can equip your church members to identify them. You can equip your church members to understand them and to relevantly respond to them. You can equip your church ministers through strategic theological training and Bible skills that can enable them to smell error and deception from a distance and protect their church members and shepherd the flock that God has put under their care. Young people, you need to learn and practice biblical discernment. The times we are living in are very deceptive 
and sometimes the deception is as close to the truth as you can ever imagine that the line between error and truth sometimes is difficult to discern and only those who are grounded in the teaching of God's truth are able to discern what is not true and therefore defend their faith from it. Be in your Bibles, understand the central teachings of the Christian faith. Critically analyze everything you hear or see. Stand firm for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That our church may not only be safe, but may be a comfortable environment in which we raise the next generation of Bible-believing, gospel-centered believers that know the why and the what of their faith. May God bless you.